argue with numbers, can you? You know, it's just like they talk about physics being elegant. It is, isn't it? There's a haunting integration between mathematics and art. And our next speaker is going to talk about the prehistoric zodiac. And uh, he is a Paleolithic art researcher going way back to earliest times. And just recently I was came across some different definitions of art. And one of them really got me. You might want to write this down. The purpose of art. <laughs> it's ubiquitous. It's, it's going it's, viral, it's, right? it's everywhere. <laughs> Plus these guys are so freaky, it's half the fun, you know. The purpose of art is to lay bare the questions which have been hidden by answers. Isn't that great? Because every age thinks they're living in modern times, right? We're not living in modern times. These are just times, right? And when we look back, say, a thousand years to the year 1000, medieval times, if you were to go back in a time machine and get out and walk around, spend a week there, you'd think, wow, it's dirty, it's cold, it's not safe. You know, this is really tough stuff, right? Well, if you'd get back in your time machine and go ahead a thousand years of us to the year 3000 and look back in some Akashic library and look at our times, how do you think they would describe our times? Wow. Wow is right. You know, don't you think they would say, Look at those people. They're out of touch with nature. They're out of touch with human nature. You know, it's stressful. It's not sustainable, is it? And I think we're starting to grasp that. And so what will be the next point? What will be the next step in human evolution? That's the bingo question, isn't it? What will we need to learn next? And I think pulling all of these people together and looking at it through their lenses gives us, almost psychically or intuitively, some little glimmers about the future. Because the present really is 90% the past, isn't it? When you look outside your eyes, you see buildings and trees and cars and people, all of which were created in yesteryear, right? Only when you meditate can you go into the real present, right? To stop the perceptions, the bombardment of the past, these answers that are in the way of questions. Isn't that interesting? To look at it like that. So really what it's about is openness. Because I think of my belief system up until just a few years ago actually as dense like a bowling ball, you know? It's like how, how are you gonna soften a bowling ball? How are you gonna make space in there? And it has to do with openness. So I'll meet our next speaker, and we're going to go way back in history and look at the same issues of love and life through primitive eyes that maybe weren't so primitive. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Okay, all right. Is this... Okay, this is on. All right. Okay, I'm going to speak from notes for a little while because I'm extremely jet-lagged, and I'm hoping I'll shake out of it eventually. But uh, anyway, well, just, just please bear with me. Now, what I want to uh, demonstrate for the next hour, I hope, is that our familiar zodiac has a much deeper history than has commonly been realized. Traditionally, the zodiac is thought to be a startup phase of Babylonian invention, and therefore no more than 3,400 years old at the very most. Instead, what myself and a colleague have been proposing is that the origin of the zodiac originates back to Ice Age Europe and the Neolithic Near East in a system of solstice and equinox calibrations that we use for marking time and recording history and events. How's the voice, is that okay? Okay, cool, all right. The zodiac as we know it today is constituted by an ecliptic coordinate system, which is a line projected into space divided by 12 imaginary objects and animals. Though a projection of the mind, the ecliptic is important since it tracks the course of the sun, planets, and moon. An immediate obstacle which presents itself when looking at sources prior to Mesopotamia 
and the early historic period is the lack of language or known writing systems. This, after all, is one of the things which prehistory defines. However, our focus is not so much about the artistic evolution of zodiacal images. We are rather reconstructing solstice and equinox circumstances and correlating those with sacred site contexts. Evidence for a fairly sophisticated understanding of astronomy from prehistoric times emerges from this. In the past, archaeoastronomy focused a lot on specific alignments with monuments. Today, it acknowledges more cultural factors, psychology included. The popular school of psychology known as Gestalt, for example, asserts the inherently human characteristic of seeing in things made of many parts something more or other than the sum of those parts. Is everyone familiar with Gestalt? Gestalt psychology? No? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, applied to archaeoastronomy is quite interesting. So that applied to ancient star watches, instead of seeing a star field as a scatter of isolated points, they saw a familiar pattern of something recognizable, like an animal shape or thing. In our deeper past, this tendency for pattern recognition means that deep sky objects, e.g. stars, were no less important than, rel than relics dug up in the field. In this way, stars and constellations were astral logbooks that, that were embodied with knowledge. Information regarding how the sky interacted with the environment. Stars and constellations became filled with omens that would predict when certain animals mate, when rivers filled with fish, etc. And as we'll go on to see, they could also predict other more threatening events in the cosmos. In short, this supports the likelihood of different people taking an interest in the skies and sharing knowledge, which applies to zodiacal schemes. A common understanding that was surprisingly widespread, irrespective of the era and latitude, was the two endpoints, from our perspective on Earth, of the Milky Way. These two largely symbolic nodes happen to mark the galactic center and anti-center. Respectively, at one end, you have the Orion, Taurus, Gemini constellations, with Scorpius, Aquila, and Ophiuchus marking the other. There is evidence that this polarity was known since prehistoric times, even if some of the mythological characters have changed. The knowledge of them was of practical value, since identifying only several of these stars from either end people could figure out where the rest of the sky was, even though it may not be seasonally hidden and out of, even though it may be seasonally hidden and out of sight. They were also of great momentum to cultures across time and space when they synchronized with the solstices and equinoxes. Okay. Well, this is a site called Bill Zingsleben um, in Germany. It is often thought that awareness of solstice periods began before equinoxes, which happened over the well, which must have happened over the past 100,000 years, when modern anthrop anthropology describes humans a mind discerning enough to notice the seasonal transformations of a year. But when did solstice awareness actually begin? Ultimately, this comes down to a question of evidence for which the material record becomes scarce in deeper prehistory. However, a site in, called Bill Zingsleben in Germany is extremely interesting. A skull found at the site showed that the skull had been intentionally smashed post-mortem as possibly part of a burial rite, which would be extremely unique for such an incredibly early time and for our understanding of Homo erectus. More controversially, an elephant bone with intentional scratch marks, seven on either end, with 14 in the middle. Can you pretty much make, make that pattern out? Was discovered at the site. A fairly compelling interpretation put forward by W.W. Tennis has this as a solstice gnomon. This time depth is far outside what we're considering, but is, it's well worth looking into. 
usually astronomy, it's at the very sort of, again, it's maybe Ice Age, no, nowhere sort of, uh, this Bill Zingsleben site is, is Homo erectus, and as you can see, it's an incredibly steep age, but anomalies like, like that are certainly worth looking into further. Right. Right, cave art. Cave art began about 50,000 years ago and spans a very long time. Despite this giant stretch, cave art remains fairly consistent. Going by recent uranium dating in Iberian caves, Neanderthals may have been cave artists too. Ever since its first discovery in Europe in the 1800s, there has emerged a variety of different ideas about what, about what cave art actually is. A very popular one um, was, was hunting magic. Um, it's, still, it's still there today in, in, uh, in a sort of modified form. Hunting magic really entailed, it made sense of cave art by seeing um, these, these Ice Age hunters as uh, that they would, draw, they would draw a picture of the animal they wished to kill inside a cave uh, interior. Uh, practice a ritual and then go out and hunt. It would supposedly enhance the efficacy of the hunt. Things have moved on since then, though. In the 1960s, uh, a famous um, French anthropologist called uh, Leroy Gohan, uh, he proposed a different scenario, a more abstract scenario. This was, uh, he proposed that uh, all of cave art, um, different animals, different um, symbols, could be subsumed under this abstract um, idea of, of sexual polarity, like the whole thing could, could be explained in terms of sexual uh, polarity, uh, male, female, um, uh, male fertility, female fertility, that, that, that sort of thing. That's sort of being replaced these days. Um, the more or less the dominant paradigm uh, these days is uh, it's, it's more shamanism and spirit animals. Um, spirit animals, uh, spirit animals are depicted on cave walls and cave walls can be the membrane between different shamanic spiritual worlds. Um, saying that, the, the idea that um, constellations may have may have been depicted in caves, has actually been there very, very early on, um, although it never actually became popular. It, re it came back out again in the, 1970s, in the 1970s in the work of the uh, American science writer Alexander Marshak. Although Marshak primarily examined engraved plaques and figurines rather than cave art, he believed that prehistoric humans explained the workings of the world by story, image, and symbol, or a type of mythology without an, identifi without an, un an identifiable text. That's very interesting because in cave art, the, the, the idea that they're spirit animals is, I mean, that, that's okay by itself, but they, they, the, the fact that they might represent mythological creatures, creatures in, the, in, in mythology of which we have no idea because, because we don't sort of understand their language, um, that, that's not really, it's, it's not really examined. Although astronomy, that sort of reintroduces that, that mythological aspect, as, as we shall see. Okay, how, how is everyone at the moment, okay? Yeah, yeah. You all understand it, okay? Because well, I'll be asking you questions afterwards. Oh. Right. Okay, so we're going to remain focused in terms of cave art on Losco, on the Losco cave complex. The Losco cave complex uh, is, is located in the Dordogne region of France. Um, it was discovered by complete accident in 1940. Um, the cave itself, the cult as a cultural centre, it's extremely late in terms of cave art. Um, for, it was in use from 17,000 to 12,000 BC. Um, and there are differences between examples found in this cave and, and the use in, in b between earlier cave art, such as the, the more advanced use of coloured pigments in the paint. 
The site itself is located on what was probably considered a very holy hill uh, far deep into prehistory. Um, about 20 minutes away from Losco complex is a, um, is a, is a, is a very symbolic um, Neanderthal um, burial where a, a, a Neanderthal man was buried in close proximity to a, uh, to a bear. And that was dated to it's about 80,000 um, 80, years before the present. So it's possible Losco was, was actually known to Neanderthals, but, but there's no evidence of that, or that the site itself was, was, was sacred um, really far deep into prehistory before, before the um, Losco people decorated the cave. Um, Losco itself, as you can see from this chart, it's, 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 it's not very big, but it's, uh, it's very complex. And uh, there's good indications that the, uh, the Losco people were religiously inclined and used the place for um, uh, mystic initiations, even. The Lusco paintings have been subject to a, a wide range of rock art interpretation. The 1990s, however, witnessed a surge of interest in seeing star maps in Lusco's art. The top right image, um, as yeah, is it no, well, top left here, and top right over there, um, that's that has attracted a lot of attention in terms of its likeness to what constellation. Taurus and Pleiades, right. Yes, that, that's really been uh, a, a center of attention. In many ways, um, it remains one of the most compelling depictions of, of, of possible, likely, Ice Age interest in astronomy, I think. And that's where it becomes interesting. The image... Um, yeah, the, the, there's, there's really been lots of, lots of different um, interpretations, but uh, a, a unique one that builds from this depiction of, uh, of Taurus Pleiades was made by a French an anthropologist called Chantal uh, Woolliwiz. Um, she suggested, she su she just suggested that um, Next left of, uh, of the Taurus image on this one and right on that side, that's what faces it in, in an area of Lusco Cave known as the Hall of the Bulls. And what uh, Chantal suggested in the early 2000s was um, opposite, opposite Taurus Pleiades in the bottom right hand corner was bottom left here, bottom right over there. Um, <laughs> Is, was actually a depiction of Antares of the Scorpius constellation, which is quite interesting because if that's the case, then that would be an, art, an Ice Age acknowledgement of the uh, galactic polarity which we looked at earlier. That could might be the you know if if if, if, if you find her her argument um, convincing, then that would be perhaps the earliest known example of, of, uh, of acknowledgement of a galactic polarity. Um, if the image next to that, however, this is where things get a bit more um, interpretive. She suggests this, that's Sagittarius, and I don't think, well, you'd have to play with that for, for a little while. But a very interesting, an immensely interesting um, discovery of hers was that... Um, she, uh, she discovered, after researching caves across Europe, um, that many cave entrances were, the, the sun shone into cave entrances, entrances at significant, significant times of the year. Indeed, out of 130 Paleolithic caves she visited, she found that 122 of them had solstice and equinox alignment, which is an extremely strong result. That's absolutely astonishing. Um, and yes, solstice and equinoxes. Of course, they would be in, um, 
extreme. They, 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 how else would I, Ice Age people tell the time? How else would they track the, the, the course and seasonal transformations of a year? When does summer become autumn? When, when does autumn become winter? Yes? When does spring emerge? Th this seasonal rhythm. Um, and what we're going to go on to say is that these, uh, these solstices and equinoxes, they, they were embodied in, um, in symbolic animals. Okay, this is the shaft scene at Lost Go. This is, um, this is actually located um, at the bottom of a pit, uh, like a 20-foot pit. Um, it's very difficult to access. You'd have to use a, uh, a rope ladder or something. Um, in t artistically speaking, this, it, this uh, as, as a work of art, it doesn't stand up to other Lost Go examples. It's, it's been considered graffiti, even. But that said, it is highly enigmatic. We don't really know, lots of people don't really know what's going on. The early ex excavators of the cave suggested that this was actually a real life um, hunting accident. They actually um, dug for, for, the, for the supposed um, uh, slain hunter at the bottom of the, ca at, at, at the, bottom of the pit, but obviously to, to, to no avail. Um, there have been other objects found at the bottom of the pit, like uh, candles, uh, candle holders, like this one depicted here, which has an image of broken signs across it, um, similar to the to the spear that's supposedly slaying that, that's supposedly slaying the, the the man who was then turning into a bird. Um, a seashell from the Atlantic coast was found there that, would, that once formed a pendant. So these ritual items were, were, were used at the bottom of this shaft in, in no doubt ritual um, environments. What do people, what, any, um, any ideas about what's being represented there? Yes? I can't see anything, sorry. A bird in his next life, right, okay, so there's a theme of, okay, some sort of, he, he's died and he's becoming a bird, something like that, or, or may, maybe some, I don't know about reincarnation. But, uh, but do you think it's, yeah, it's, it's not entirely straightforward, because as, as, as we see, there's a, a bird, uh, on a stick, which, which we'll interpret as a grouse. Um, it, that might possibly be part of a, of a spear thrower or something. It, it may not be. Um, as, you, as you can tell, the, the, the beak on the bird is, is the same as the, as, as the man's beak. So the, the, there's, there's a, a lot of complexity. There are two other figures as well, which we're going to look at in a minute. There's a, a rhino and a horse. But this, this shaft, it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite limited, but it's a roughly circular structure. Um, okay, there have been, there has been, well, one prominent interpret astronomical interpretation of this. This was made by somebody called Michael Rappengluck, who, uh, who perhaps following someone else's uh, suggestion, who suggested that uh, the summer triangle, uh, the stars, Altair, Deneb, and, uh, and Vega were found in, Sh in, um, in Chauvet Cave in this sort of triangle, which, which is a bit random. He applied that to the eyes, as you can see. He, he thinks that, that the whole sort of graphic image has bearing upon, upon those three summer triangle stars. Now, that, that's good. I mean, I think more interpretations the merrier, because then it, it, people get to think about things more. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, really. No, neither does my colleague, and lots of other people don't either. It's, there's, there's something a bit sort of static about it. There's something I think myself and my colleague think that the, sh the shaft scene was depicting, more, it was more of an event. It was something, something possibly occurring annually. Um, well, I mean, that occurs annually, but it was something a bit more dramatic. 
Um, okay, this is okay. Well, this is another image of the shaft scene. As you can see, it's it's um, yes. If you haven't visited Lusco, um, you, you get the idea that this is actually quite a small image. Uh, the rhino and and the, and the bull together are about six foot across. It's it's actually quite it's it's quite imposing. And the bull itself is on this curved um, this this curved wall. Sorry, when did I start? I can't because this their talk was delayed. I don't know how long how much longer I have. Okay. Right. Well, we're going to look at this quite simply. Um, this is this is our um, deconstruction of of the shaft scene. That this is what we think um, is is possibly depicting. Um, Let's start with the bird on the stick. The bird on the stick um, is a grouse. We believe that cali the, the, our calibration dates, they, they correspond to when, the, when Lusco was inhabited. Uh, we think the grouse is Libra and corresponds to the spring equinox. There's good indication that, that that's, a, that's a good characteri characterization because in, in other contexts, the grouse it has a it has a shamanic aspect, but in it, the grouse is also known for a curious um, mating ritual in spring. It would become very noticeable. Uh, the rhino, we think, corresponds not exactly well Taurus Aries, possibly more Aries. I would have thought actually. You see, you see it a bit better here. There's another indication. <coughs> <clears throat> why this might be a good character for, for the autumn equinox. If, if you can perhaps notice from there, the six, the six dots um, nearly hang out, hanging out of his back end, they actually appear elsewhere in Lusco. They appear, uh, there's, there's a, a section known as the, uh, the it's, it's a tunnel of the, of the felines. And there's six dots there that, that appear when the, when, 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 the, when the tunnel's actually sort of becoming so narrow that you can't um, pass through. So it's, that's the only depiction of a rhino in the cave, but it's interesting that these six dots are juxtaposed with it, which again could indicate, um, you know, it's like the autumn equinox, things are becoming, you know, they're, they're, they're waning, they're, they're thinning out. Next. Next, we find the mare, which we interpretate, interpret as, uh, as Leo, which marked the winter solstice at, those period, at, at that period. Um, elsewhere in, in Australia, yeah, the, the, a mare's head, a horse's head, horse sacrifice, they have been associated with the winter solstice. Um, in terms of characterization, the horse, a mare, it's, it's a lot lighter, it's more swift. Than, than a portly, chaotic rhino, so it, it marks the, the, the idea of the sun starting to build up um, light and energy at the start of a year. However, let's look at the... Okay, the... Oops, sorry. Let's look at the most important figure, which, which is the, which is the, uh, the bison. Elsewhere, there's, uh, you, you, in, in Lusco, you do have two bulls uh, elsewhere, uh, not in the shaft. Uh, they're at the end of a hallway. Uh, one of them has skin, skin that's peeling off, which is taken to represent summer. A lot of an anthropologists uh, think that. And another one has, has, have, has more of a, uh, a thicker coat, which is taken to, re to represent uh, uh, winter. This one, the, the, the shaft bison, resembles the summer one quite a lot, but not just for that reason alone. The, the, the reason why, why it becomes interesting, and this is what, what the, the event that we think uh, the, the, shaft scene, the, the shaft scene might record, um, during this, the, at the time, uh, a, a meteor shower known as the Torrid, the Torrid meteor shower, was seen to erupt from, uh, from the constellation of Capricornus. Okay, 
this isn't a question of, of the Lotsco people sort of uh, looking up at the sky and saying, you know, well, hey man, that's the, the, they're the Taurids. How, how would they understand a, an annual outpour, an annual meteor outpour like that? They would likely frame it in terms of something like celestial lightning, celestial fire, something like that, something ruffle that um, perhaps even a sense of sort of Promethean uh, fire, possibly, which would correspond to some of the ritual elements found in the shaft. Um, so that's what we suggest, that uh, this spear, this broken spear, may actually be a sort of discharge that actually occurred annually um, when Lusco was, was inhabited. Uh, what, what, what do people think about that? Um, any objections? <laughs> okay. Oh, sure. Uh, right, okay. Um, right, okay. Right, Tor okay. As I said earlier, Losco marks the period when, when cave art was really coming to a close. It was beginning to wind up. Cultural transitions were, were afoot. Um, now we, we're going to jump across to, uh, to um, southern Anatolia. Now, Gobekli Tepe, which uh, you heard Robert speaking about, oh, well, uh, where to begin? Uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, okay, usually you hear about uh, the fact that not much of the site has been uncovered. That's absolutely true. That's ab archaeologically, that's absolutely true. However, that doesn't imply that, um, that there's m much more of the site that, that is as early as the earliest known structures so, uh, as, as, uh, so far uncovered. This uh, geo-radar scan shows you um, a couple of older um, uh, circles that are as old as uh, Enclosure D. Enclosure D is the oldest known enclosure at the site, circle at the site which dates to 9,600 um, BC. Um, that's, an, that, that's a very important time. Um, well, if you're interested in Atlantis, that, that's, it's interesting in that, for that reason. But um, 9,600 BC also marks the end of the Younger Dryas. Um, now, regardless of what um, caused the Younger Dryas, um, it, its cultural influence um, cannot be underestimated, and Gobekli Tepe is it's, it's a pretty firm statement of that, certainly in terms of age. Now, I visited uh, Gobekli Tepe early in, in May of this year, and I was, I was allowed into to some of the enclosures, so uh, there's, a, there's a, a couple of things that we're going to talk about here, just quickly. Um, right, in terms of the galactic polarity that we were talking about, the vulture stone. Uh, lots of you are probably aware that um, that this is this has been heavily interpreted as perhaps marking uh, Scorpius at the summer solstice. That there are other figures there as well. Um, you know, uh, Cygnus is a, is a candidate. Um, that there's, that there's there's other stuff as well. Um, however, that's fairly irrelevant to me because what I find interesting is that the scorpion um, on, on this stone, it's, uh, it's the only known scorpion at the site, which makes it doubly interesting. Um, I find it, I think that's a very good correlation with, um, with this pillar, pillar 18, uh, and also uh, the top of pillar 31. Uh, they're, they're the tops, um, the, 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 the what uh, Robert suggested was a gateway earlier is on the right, and uh, the, the top of pillar 31 of the cranium is, is uh, the twin, the, the, the twin of that pillar. And there are seven, uh, seven uh, birds, which are probably great bustards. Um, at the, these aren't um, arbitrarily placed um, megaliths. The, 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 these are very, the pillar 18, is, it couldn't be more central. These were very important glyphs. And it's interesting in terms of um, how the Scorpius, if that corresponds with Scorpius, you have a Bucranium, you have Taurus, um, you have what looks like uh, a Gemini figure, and you have seven birds, which are quite 
convincing in terms of uh, Pleiades. If you look um, at this time as well, the winter solstice, it's quite interesting what was happening astronomically. Um, the, the, solstice, the winter solstice was transitioning from Gemini to Taurus. There's so much more I can't go, on to, go into here, but uh, it's my idea that these um, pillars, well, firstly, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not with other people that uh, Gobekli Tepe records uh, a catastrophe, a catas a, 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 any sort of, I don't think there's any, anything like that going on at the site. I do believe uh, that these twin pillars might represent something that we'd, we would identify as hero twins, the survivors of a climate catastrophe on the scale of the Younger Dryas, quite possibly. That's, that's really interesting, I think, and it's, it's, worth, uh, uh, it's worth looking into. Um, well, okay, sure. Well, oh, and it continues as well. We, uh, me and my colleague, we, we, we look to Chetelhoyok, which obviously succeeds Gobekli Tepe in terms of um, uh, uh, solstice, equinox, um, zodiac correlations. Uh, but I think we'll have to leave that till next time. Uh, yes? Well, thank you very much for being a splendid audience, and it's lovely to be in California. Thank you.